Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Greece is Going Green. My name is Amy Waller, Marketing Manager at Harrison Manufacturing and I will be your host today. Before we start, I would just like to go over a few housekeeping items. Throughout the webinar, there are a few ways you may communicate with us. The first is the raise your hand button. Please only use this if you are having any tech issues and need to chat directly with me, the host. When you raise your hand, I will contact you privately to help you out. The second is the Q&A button. We'd love to hear from you. So if you have any questions regarding the presentation, either for Dr. Honorary or Harrison Manufacturing, please ask us by posing a question in Q&A. We will endeavor to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. However, if we do not get to yours live on the call, we'll be sure to contact you over the next couple of days and follow up. And lastly, once the webinar is finished, a follow follow up survey will pop up, which we would like to encourage you to complete. It will only take a minute of your time and your feedback is vital to ensure we continue to provide you informative webinars in the future. The webinar will also be recorded. So if you would like a copy of the recording, please reach out to myself or your Harrison Manufacturing Account Manager and we will provide you with a link to the recording. So now that we have all the housekeeping out of the way, I would like to introduce you to our main presenter and business partner, Dr. Lou Honorary. President of Environmental Lubricants Manufacturing, or ELM for short. Dr. Honorary is a world-renowned advocate for bio-based grease and lubricants and served as professor and founding director of the National Agriculture-Based Lubricants Centre at the University of Northern Iowa, where his team developed over 30 vegetable oil-based grease and lubricant formulations. Lou has also served as officer, editorial advisor, and board member for several technical organisations. We are really excited to have Lou here with us today, but before he begins his presentation, I would like to introduce you to Mike Raleigh, General Manager of Sales and Marketing at Harrison Manufacturing, who will talk a little about what we do and our long-term relationship with ELM over the years. Thank you. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Amy, and welcome, Lou. Thanks for joining us today to all the webinar participants. First of all, I'd like to briefly introduce Harrison Manufacturing. We're a proudly Australian-owned manufacturing company and we've been in business providing grease and lubricant solutions since 1949. Today, we're Australia's leading independent expert in the development, manufacture and supply of high-performance grease and lubricants. We're constantly listening to our customers and looking for opportunities to introduce new products into new markets across a range of different geographies. We're now finding that there is an emerging interest in an inquiry in environmentally friendly products and uh, we had a gap in our range. So some time ago, we met with Lou at an annual NLGI conference in the US and subsequently have partnered with Lou and ELM to extend our product range to include such bioproducts. Our vocabulary now includes concepts and words such as bio-based, biodegradable, environmentally friendly, and eco-friendly. There are essentially two criteria that end users are evaluating when considering environmentally friendly products. And they are performance and price. And we're seeking parity with the more traditional petroleum based products. We are now at the crossroads or are very close to being at the crossroads where parity on these key criteria is upon us. ELM partners with distrib distributors that are leaders in their field and have a sales force that is committed to selling environmentally friendly products alongside their existing petroleum oil based products. It's a privilege to be able to uh, give an alternative. Harrison Manufacturing complement this requirement and is the business partner of choice for distributing ELM products in Australia. Today, Lou is gonna take us on a bio journey which has spanned nearly 30 years in the making, outlining the evolving development of these products. Th Lou, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, uh, address us today and uh, over to you. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, Mike. Um, <clears throat> this is indeed a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak about something that I've been passionate about for over 30 years. And I'd like to thank uh, Harrison Manufacturing again for the opportunity. So we're going to move quickly into our presentation. The agenda includes a review of historical development of bio-based and biodegradable lubricants. We will have a few statistics about the global biolube market, US and Australia. We'll talk about advantages and disadvantages of bio-based and vegetable oils. We'll talk about a few application 
success stories, and then chat about some of the products that are in our portfolio. Um, very quickly, we talk about biobase and biodegradable. Um, biobase is a US created terminology. When we worked on this early on, the goal was to focus on inclusion of renewable materials in the lubricants or other products. We thought that if we are replacing petroleum oil with some renewable hydrocarbon, then we have met our, our goals. And to do that, uh, we didn't want to focus necessarily on biodegradability, understanding that bio-based products in general are more environment friendly. But we thought that if you have a, uh, let's say an engine oil that has 3% renewable material in it, it probably would be better than an engine oil that has nothing. And so in the US, the goal is on petroleum substitution, whereas biodegradable, which is mostly recognized by the Europeans and asked for by the Europeans, relies on uh, the biodegradability of the product, regardless of being bio-based, natural, or petroleum derived. So, uh, and, and the biodegradability is based on OECD 301 series tests. You can have some product like PAOs that are derived from mineral oil, from petroleum, and be biodegradable. But a PAO that is biodegradable is not bio-based. So it will not be acceptable as a bio-based in the United States, but it will be biodegradable. But most bio-based products are biodegradable. However, not many biodegradable products, or not all of biodegradable products are also necessarily bio-based. So let me give you a quick introduction to um, how we got started on this. Just on, on a personal side, in 1991, when I was teaching a hydraulic class, a student of mine wrote a paper on bio-based hydraulic oils. At the time, he also was able to, to secure two pails of a hydraulic oil that was developed in Europe. It was Mobile EAL224H. And a representative of Mobile sent two pails to my attention. We put in our hydraulic test stands and, and I was amazed. And so we went to the Soybean Association and asked if we could get a grant to look at creating a soybean-based hydraulic oil. I, I, I'm a mechanical engineer, so at the time I was not aware of the shortcomings of soybean oil. And then I learned later that the student who wrote the paper was part of a team at John Deere. Now we have five of the John Deere plants in our university town, including their worldwide headquarters for research and development. And so the student was part of a team of John Deere engineers working with the Lubrizol Corporation to develop the first ever universal tractor transmission hydraulic fluid. When they developed it, they called it bio high guard. And Deere had determined that in Germany, they were going to ban the use of uh, mineral-based hydraulic oils in the Black Forest area. So they had started developing this product and early on they had decided that soybean oil was not stable enough for creation of a uh, tractor hydraulic fluid. And so when we got a grant from the Soybean Association, basically over four years, we were able to mimic the performance of canola oil with a chemically modified soybean oil. And then we took all of the research and development that they have created, including their additives and incorporated into our soybean oil. And in 2006, we had the first ever soybean based universal tractor transmission hydraulic fluid. We marketed that in, in, 2000, in 1997, and then we patented it in 1998. And then, um, interestingly, the original um, interest in vegetable oil-based lubricants came from Europe. In fact, a, a company called Binol in Sweden was the first that had created some um, rapeseed-based chainsaw lubricant. And when I visited with them, they were very excited that all over Europe there was talk of vegetable oil lubricants. In the US, that effort started in 1990. And if you had gone to an ASTM meeting in 1990, you would have found um, almost every major petroleum company having a representative there. The Lubrizol Corporation really created a lot of great additives. They spent a huge amount of money. And later on, they were disappointed and that the market didn't turn around because they had expected that in a few years, everybody would be asking for bio-based products, but that never happened. Our research center grew to become a national 
Agriculture Lubricant Center. And then um, in 2000, U.S. manufacturers pretty much um, abandoned, let me see, uh, including lubricants that abandoned their efforts. In 2000, we formed environmental lubricants manufacturing to show the commercial viability of vegetable oil lubricants that had been created at our university research center. So ELM was formed by myself and the University Research Foundation, and later I became the full owner of that. In the decade of 2010, the Europeans began to come back, and surprisingly, although they were the leader when they started in this area, uh, they, they came to the U.S. to buy bio-based products because we continued, and then the agriculture community in the U.S. and the United States Department of Agriculture continued to promote these concepts. And then the current decade has seen a tremendous interest, primarily because the younger generation are concerned about, um, more concerned about the environment, and it seems like there is a renewed interest in bio-based lubricants worldwide. I want to very quickly go over some of the um, uh, statistics. When you look at the um, total global bio-based lubricant consumption, it's been less than 1% for the last 10, 15 years. Any company that has done surveys have found still um, you know, uh, less than 1%. But at least in the US, uh, the majority of that 1%, which is still a, a reasonable amount for smaller companies like ours, 40% of all the bio-based products worldwide are used in the US. Asia Pacific covers 25%, North, American, uh, North America remains top consumers, including Canada. And um, Australia still is lagging behind somewhat uh, due to lack of legislation, which normally generates some pull from the market. Um, when we look at the um, uh, base stocks and the demand by products, you see that hydraulic oil is one of the first products that everyone tries to develop. In fact, there are a lot of formulations out there that people uh, purchase a given um, vegetable oil and a given additive package and for, uh, package it together, just like engine oils are formulated. And they, they develop products like that. Uh, metal working fluids are next in line in terms of the demand and then transform oil, oil chainsaw lubricants, gear oils and automotive engine oils, which is very, very small amount and all the others. Uh, and then in terms of most of the product-based stocks because of the, especially in the European cold temperature climates, synthetic esters are the largest base stock to use for bio-based or for environment-friendly lubricants. Vegetable oils come second, and then we go to some of these other products. Now, very quickly, uh, I want to talk about U.S. Um, lubricants market. And this is uh, some number that has really remained pretty stable over the years. Uh, we have about 2.5 billion gallons total lubricant market uh, usage in the United States on an annual basis. Of that, 1.1 billion gallon or 44% is industrial and 1.4 or um, billion or 56% is automotive. We decided early on at our research center that we were going to focus our efforts on industrial lubricants. We thought rather than going after engine oils, which are so well developed in petroleum uh, format and the synthetics that are out there to get a vegetable oil that already has certain deficiencies to reach the performance level of an automotive engine oil made of synthetic or, or PAOs or petroleum, um, any, any one of the groups of base oils, it would be very difficult and the price will be very high. However, in the industrial areas, there are several what we call low hanging fruit where we could focus on and, and be successful and at the same time consume every uh, drop of excess vegetable oil we have in the US. Now looking at the uh, Europe, uh, again, Australian market and thanks to the Harrison engineers for providing some of these slides, you can see that the lion's share of the um, lubricants are still engine oils, 23% gasoline and 25% diesel engine oils. And then come transmission fluid, automotive gear oils, industrial uh, and hydraulic oils and greases being only 5%. So you can see if we add the transmission fluid and gear oils um, into the already 48% of the engine oils, uh, the majority of the lubricants we're talking in Australia is really uh, the automotive uh, related. Um, in the US, the U.S. national policy is actually calling for creation of renewable biofuels, biopower, and bio-based products. 
I was part of a joint um, committee of United States Department of Agriculture and Department of Energy for three years. And this is when we developed some, and, and that committee is continuing, but my, I had three year tenure there. And, and these are some of the goals that we had uh, that still continues and there are funding to promote these concepts. So by the year 2030, we're looking at 55.3 billion gallons of bioproducts. Now, bioproducts is not necessarily biolubricants. Biolubricants is one part of the bioproducts. So bioplastic falls into that. And there are anything that is derived from bio-based materials then will become that bioproducts. So there are fundings available. Researchers and university researchers or uh, industrial private companies can apply for. And we hope to be able to reach those goals by the year 2030. Now, very quickly, when you look at the worldwide production of vegetable oils, uh, annually, there's about 21.5 billion gallons of vegetable oils produced. Of that, the biggest amount is 6.2 billion gallons soybean oil. Then comes uh, palm oil at 4.8 billion, and then rapeseed and Canadian version of it, canola, or 31, uh, 3.1 billion and so on. So of this 6.2 billion gallon of soybean oil, about half of it is produced in the United States. So we have a very, very well established industry in soybean association and soybean growers and, and the infrastructure is fantastic. And, and those half the, the half the oils that are produced in the US are produced in five or six states right around the state of Iowa where I'm located. So you cannot, you can actually look outside of ELM within a quarter of a mile, you'll see the soybean field. So we're smack in the middle of the, the field. So this is very close to our hearts in, in the mid state of, uh, Midwest state of the United States. Now we need to understand the, the advantages and disadvantages of vegetable oils in general. Uh, naturally, um, vegetable oils are better lubricants and that is because they bond to metal surfaces better than mineral oils do. Mineral oils are very good carriers of additives to create good lubricants. Vegetable oils naturally are good lubricants. And so that's one of the starting advantages. They present a much better viscosity pressure performance. They have a superior thin film strength. All of them are tested and documented by our uh, center and, and they're all published actually. And then they have excellent viscosity index. So as an example, the viscosity index of soybean oil is 222. And if you take an equivalent viscosity mineral oil, let's say um, uh, 40 centistokes at 40 degrees C, which is equal to almost uh, viscosity of soybean oil in a mineral oil, the viscosity index will be 95. So the viscosity index of vegetable oil is almost more than twice that of an equivalent viscosity petroleum oil. What that means is that you can have a, where you require an ISO 68 hydraulic oil, for example, you can have an ISO 46 vegetable oil hydraulics fluid, and they'll still perform the same as ISO 68 because at, at the operating temperature, a mineral oil would thin down a lot more than a vegetable oil do. So an ISO 46 would do as good as ISO 68. Well, that could be a very advantageous because now your starting torques would be lower on your pumps and, and your systems, especially in the colder climates and in, um, on engines with cold engines and so on. So that's one advantage that we can talk about. Lower volatility, that has been fantastic uh, uh, in metalworking application. Uh, lower flash and fire point makes great for um, foundries and building elevators and all of those are are advantages. A high level of biodegradability, renewable resource, it reduces dependence on imported petroleum. It's less toxic to the plant and, and um, soil. Um, and then good lubricating properties in general. However, they do have some shortcomings. And now I, I always emphasize that when we say vegetable oils lack, lack oxidative stability, if they're untreated, so in their natural form, they may lack oxidative stability, but we can improve by treating it. And there are many ways we can improve that and we'll talk about it uh, short, shortly. Or if they're untreated, they have a higher pore points. That means they freeze at higher temperatures than mineral oils of the same viscosity. And I used to say they're generally more expensive than petroleum oils, but I have to now put question marks because petroleum prices have gone up. and 
we also have improved our technology and processing capabilities to the point where we can actually deliver vegetable-based and bio-based lubricants in certain areas that are equivalent or in price parity with petroleum oils. So let's talk about those uh, uh, the, the, the problems that, that you really need to focus on if you're contemplating getting into bio-based um, development. Number one is oxidation stability. So normally mineral industry starts working on what they are familiar with. So rotary pressure vessel oxidation test, RPVOT, formerly called bomb oxidation test, is the one that everyone wants to use for testing the oxidation. And if you put the best vegetable oil that you have, the most stable vegetable oil and the poorest vegetable oil in terms of oxidation and stability in an RPVOT test, they all are gonna fail. They're gonna give you the same number of minutes anywhere between 40 minutes and lower. And so if truly you want to see the best, the difference between the best vegetable oil and the worst vegetable oil, you need to use uh, instruments that are designed to look at vegetable oils. So the oil stability index, which is a AS, AOCS method and is written up there CD12B-92, that is a test that we use and a lot of food industries use to determine the oxidation stability of vegetable oils. And so um, uh, before we had an access to the oxidation stability and we were at the university, we basically tried to go and do what John Deere engineers recommended to us to run ASTM test methods. Now this ASTM D7043 originally was ASTM D2271, which was a thousand hour hydraulic pump test. And uh, it's a really stringent test. And if you could pass this test with a hydraulic oil made of vegetable oil, then you know your product is going to su be successful in the field. And the way the test works is that you have the components of a vein pump. This is a 104C vein pump. It has the cam ring, the veins, and the plates here. You weigh the cam ring and the plates uh, before the test, and you have five gallons of vegetable oil in an open vessel, uh, open reservoir, stainless steel, two feet above the pump, and you circulate it through the pump into a heat exchanger and back into the reservoir. So the heat exchanger has a sensor, a pen valve that, that keeps the temperature exactly at 79 degrees centigrade. The pressure is set up with the relief valve at 1000 PSI and you circulate it for a thousand hours. And when we did that, we would take a sample every hundred hours. So we'll have 10 samples per thousand hours and we would see what happens to the viscosity and total acid number of the oil. If the viscosity and acid number increase more than 10% in 10 in 1,000 hours, then we would fail that product for commercial value. And so because we were a university and Vickers at the time, now owned by Eaton, uh, would donate these cartridges, which were $680 at the time, uh, a large quantity was very generously. We ran, we had five of these test stands with student labor, so we tested every vegetable oil that we could get our hands on from exotic oils to commodity, soybean, canola, sunflower, palm oil. We tested every oil we could get our hands on, including mixtures of those. And we published all of them or we have them in our library. So we have in excess of a hundred individual thousand hour pump tests in our library um, that were developed at the university. This is an example of a regular commodity soybean oil uh, in a thousand hour pump test, you, we can see that the viscosity went up 86 um, centis, uh, went to 86 centistokes starting from about 32. By the time we got to this point, the gear, the um, oil that was like SAE 10W30 <laughs> looked more like a, a gear oil as uh, at a cold, cold morning. And so, um, and, and at the same time, DuPont had created a high oleic soybean oil that naturally was stable with over 83% oleic acid. And it um, had a almost flat viscosity through the whole thousand hours. So uh, we, we can quickly go through some samples of crude soybean oil, low lenolenic soybean oil. These are just examples of hundreds of different tests we ran. And we basically documented that the higher the oleic acid content of a vegetable oil, the less change in viscosity 
of the uh, oil in a thousand hour pump test. And so palm oil is a very stable oil, 38% oleic acid, but as you know, it has a lot of palmitic acid, which is very stable. And it had only 12.97 change, uh, centisoaks change in its viscosity. And uh, there was, uh, you know, canola oil, for example, we have two different versions. One presented better performance because in addition to oleic acid, you can then look at linolenic acid, which is a three double bond fatty acid in the um, molecule of the, um, of the oil. Then those other fatty acids begin to play a role if you have two equivalent um, vegetable oil. So this is a chart that shows the same um, uh, vegetables that I just presented. And you can see the high oleic oil um, was the highest. And these, uh, since AOM or active oxygen method was one of the more common tests at the time we were running these OSI tests, we documented that as well. Okay, so how do we improve the oxidation and stability? We can either chemically modify it. One way is to partially hydrogenate. You can fully hydrogenate the oil and make Cresco, which is very, very stable oil. And you can see it in cookies and, and um, uh, fruit bars and so on. It lasts forever, but uh, uh, the oil will be solid at room temperature. So we partially hydrogenate it to have liquid, but stabilized. Estolize is one that uh, is a, a patented process and um, it's one way of um, esterifying and chemically modifying um, vegetable oils and uh, currently biosynthetics in the US actually market that commercially. Uh, there are various esterification, it's reacting the vegetable oil with alcohols and you get simple and complex esters, or you can use a combination of all of these. Uh, we can also genetically enhance the oil seeds so that they will have a higher stability. You can imagine there are also transgenic uh, seeds that are more controversial, but there could be uh, genes of some cold um, uh, species of, of soybeans found somewhere in the, in the world, uh, transplanted into genes of some regular soybean oils that are grown in the US and, and get the pro properties that you want. So there are all sorts of enhancement uh, genetically, sometimes by selection, sometimes by, by manipulation that can take place. Uh, of course, antioxidants and um, other additives could be used, or we can use a combination of all of these. But I can tell you that if someone needs a particular stability for a, uh, vegetable oils, we certainly are confident that we can deliver that by uh, a combination of all these methods. The second problem with vegetable oils is the cold temperature. And as you know, normally we use what is called pore point, which is ASTM D92. And that is cooling a, a given a standard quantity of oil in a, this is a dry ice, is a manual pore point tester. You cool it down three degrees at a time and you tip it until the, pour, the oil doesn't tip anymore. So that's the pore point. Um, so the pore point is a very common known viscosity uh, um, uh, parameters for mineral oil products or petroleum products. And um, we learned early on that it's not the best uh, way of determining the cold temperature performance of vegetable oils because vegetable oils have different fats in them. For example, soybean oil has 6% palmitic oil in it. Now, if we put soybean oil, let's say with minus nine degrees centigrade uh, pore point, if you put it in a chamber at nine degree positive centigrade, that palmitic oil may start freezing at that temperature. And that freezing of one fat that is floating inside the soybean oil could seed the rest of the oil to continue to, to um, freeze. And eventually the oil will freeze at higher than what you thought was the pore point of it. So we, we agree that we have determined that if we want to run the pore point instrument, we definitely need to have more exposure to that temperature. So when we want to see if a particular hydraulic oil will perform at minus 20 degrees centigrade below zero, we'll put in a cold temperature storage and expose it to at minimum for 24 hours at best to go for 48 hours. And if the oil doesn't freeze or maybe even go longer, then we know it will perform. Otherwise, pore point could be misleading when used for vegetable oils. Um, when we talk about greases, then we definitely try to go with uh, either a grease mobility test apparatus, which has a chamber, you cool it 
to whatever, let's say minus 10 degrees, then you apply 150 PSI nitrogen pressure and collect the grease out of a standard orifice to see how many grams pour out at, at the given temperature. Or we use Lincoln vent meter, which is a 25 foot of a tw um, quarter inch diameter um, a pipe uh, that you pressurize it to 2000 PSI and, and then expose it to cold temperature to see how well um, it freezes or it flows or it vents when you open the, the, the exit valve. We also propose that Lincoln vent meter, if it's four hours in the standard, when it comes to vegetable oil, you do want to go more than four hours. We recommend 24 hours or 48 hours. Otherwise, you get a misleading. It may pass at four hours, but you put the same grease for 24 hours in the truck centralized greasing system with 25, 30 feet of hoses to get to the greasing zerks, it may not work, it may freeze. So that's these are warnings that we like to issue because we have been dealing with these for many years. So how do we improve the cold temperature performance? Number one, you can winterize the vegetable oils. Winterization is shocking the oil, exposing it to cold temperatures. So some of the heavier fats would freeze and then you filter those and then you go to another 10 degrees or five degrees below where you were to shock some more of the fats that are floating to freeze. The problem is when you winterize a vegetable oil and remove the saturated fats out of it, then your oxidation stability suffers. <laughs> so it's a double-edged sword. You can improve the cold temperature, but at the same time, you damage your oxidation stability because the saturated oils, fats that, that you separate because of cold temperature actually improve the oxidation stability. You can use pore point depressant. You can mix it with lower pore point fluids. You can chemically modify the seed oils to, um, to get them to like partial, um, uh, yeah, you can um, uh, winterize it or you can um, basically chemically modify it by uh, esterification, for example, uh, reaction with alcohols to get it to colder temperature. Or you can have genetically enhanced oil seed with colder temperature performance, or ultimately we hope to have all of these at our disposal to get the best cold temperature on our vegetable oils. One other thing that we caution everyone to be aware of, people go and create a hydraulic oil, made, they buy vegetable oils, let's say from Cargill and an additive package from Lubrizol and they mix them together, they say they have a hydraulic oil, but vegetable oils have con compatibilities that are different than mineral oils. You have to be careful about the compatibility of vegetable oils with metals, with other oils and um, other, if it greases other greases, with different polymers and different elastomers. So uh, there are actually publications like this one. Uh, I, I put the website in one of these, um, I thought that it was somewhere, but yeah, it's at the bottom here. That shows compatibility, all materials, including vegetable oils, with the materials like met, um, metals, plastics, and elastomers. When you create a, a bio-based products, compatibility with elastomers, especially rubber hoses and seals is very, very important. And we have heard of a lot of failures, people who don't understand it. Unfortunately, when you create a hydraulic oil that is not compatible with the seals in your pump, you will not see the results immediately. You will not see it in a week or in two weeks, but it could be a month two months or five months, and then suddenly you will be begin to see all the, all the leakage of the seals and so on. So it's extremely important. We do not send a hydraulic oil out unless we have seen compatibility results with elastomers. And of course, we have documentation to know which elastomers are compatible. And if you're dealing with customers that want to use it in their equipment or OEMs, we make sure that we have communicated that in advance. Now, I'd be remiss if I don't mention what is happening with um, what we call industrial crop. There is an association for advancement of industrial crops in the US and their website is listed here. Uh, I had presented at this group one time and I was impressed with the fact that there were about 70 different industrial crops from around the world that were being investigated by various researchers uh, as part of this group. Let me just quickly point out what the benefits of this is. Uh, people sometimes criticize us who are having, um, taking a, an edible oil like uh, soybean oil and making an industrial use out of it. 
we're doing it because we have excess capacity and we have to find a home for it because we need the meal out of this soybean for our crop, for our um, uh, animal feed and the excess oil has to find a home. So we have gone to biodiesel, we've gone to um, bio-based lubricants and greases and bioplastic and you name it. But there are some crops that grow naturally all around the world that have oil uh, seeds in them that can be extracted. And so i have give you a couple of examples. One is a camelina, for example, number four here. This crop um, can grow in area that, that has less than 6% moisture. That means in Mexico or in the US in the New Mexico area, we can grow this. Currently, the state of Montana in the US actually gives some rebate to the farmers that grow this crop. It has twice as much oil as soybeans. So you get about 39, 40% oil out of the crop. You can use the same harvest equipment that you use or, or um, uh, planting equipment that you use for soybeans with this. And it doesn't need as much water. So you can imagine suddenly half of the arid lands around the world could be possibly um, using this crop. Um, there, there is a crop called kufia, um, number three, that grows on the roadsides, especially in Illinois in the United States. These are annual crops that grow naturally. They have beautiful flowers, so it could beautify our roads and highways. And at the same time, we can harvest it once a year. And the oil that comes out of this kufia has a lot of industrial value. It could be for fuels or could be for lubricants. And I can go on and on about so many crops that are all around the world that people have been looking at them. They didn't know that they have um, seeds or some oil seeds in them that, uh, that can be extracted. And so we believe that these industrial crops someday could be used to grow crops in areas that people are short, they don't have rain or they have droughts, that they can grow some of these crops and create their own fields and lubricants. Also, I, I do want to mention safflower, uh, number five here. There is an um, industrial, um, uh, industrial group actually in Australia has come up with a very high oleic, over 90% oleic acid safflower oil that uh, is fantastic. Frankly, if they could inter if they could ship some to the US, we buy anything that they can grow this year because it's a fantastic, very stable oil. And someday that oil could be a big crop for the Australian uh, country, for Australia to both export the seeds or export the oil or basically teach other people to, or, or um, commercialize it to other countries. So I'm looking forward to working with this group because um, uh, this oil from what I've seen in the uh, publication is just fantastic. So let me quickly uh, switch to some application areas that I, as I talked earlier about some low hanging fruit. Uh, early on when we started our ELM, the first product we focused on was rail curve grease and we worked with a company uh, called Portec, which was the largest distributor or OEM of grease dispensing equipment in the United States. They got exclusive marketing right to our, um, our grease. And within two years, we got 25% of the US market by getting Norfolk Southern, which is one of the five class one railroads in the United States and, and has 90%. These five class one railroads have 90% of the US rails. <laughs> they operate 90% percent of the U.S. Rail, railroads. So when we got one of the five, we had about 20 percent of the U.S. market overnight converted to, to bio-based lubricants. So we spent a lot of time perfecting the technology by going to the field and working with them. Plus, we had grants from the U.S. Department of uh, Transportation to study the differences between mineral and bio-based curve grease. We also have learned that since 2013, the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency has a requirement uh, that every vessel of um, certain length coming ship, um, ocean going vessel coming to US waters, they have to report how much of their turbine oil or greases or lubricants touch the US waters, unless they are using bio-based products and then they can get a, a vessel general permit. And so that vessel general permit has created huge demand for wire rope grease and hydraulic oils and the turbine oils so that the, if they use these products, then they don't have to um, work with US uh, Environmental Protection Agency, 
which is really a fine agency, but who would like to go to an environmental agency in a different country and, and report how much of their products touch the water. So it's really very attractive alternative for ships and ships um, and shipyards. Uh, drill rod grease is another product that has huge potential because most of the current drill rod greases being used in the world are barium based. And barium being a heavy metal has been banned in many countries. I know in 2020, Canada began to ban this, the use of bar barium greases, although they're still in use, but barium uh, uh, is a heavy, heavy metal that, that remains in the environment that doesn't dis um, biodegrade. And so there's a lot of pull from the market for an um, for a alternative. So we've got a um, an aluminum complex. I can go on with pictures of these. So rail curve grease. Here's a, a bar that is attached to the inside of um, a track. This is a laboratory version, but in the actual field, you've got two 48 inch long bars that the grease comes from a, a reservoir with a pump run by a battery, uh, charged by a, um, a solar cell. And then uh, there is a, um, a proximity sensor or a wheel sensor that triggers the pump to operate. So when you have a train coming, as soon as the wheels go by this sensor, it triggers the controller to turn the pump on and you can adjust it to turn the pump on for one second to 1 64th of a second or to infinitely as small as you want. So if the train is going very fast, you say, well, turn the pump on 1 64th of a second for every wheel. Then the pump keeps on pumping as long as the train go by. And then the grease will come out of the bars on the inside of the track. And the flange of the wheel, this is equal to circumference of the flange of the, uh, the uh, wheel of a, local, uh, a, a train car in the United States. So the entire wheel gets greased. And that, that wheel, the flange of the wheel that is greased carries the grease around the curves. So um, we have tested these and normally they sit there and watch in addition to actually using what is called a turbometer, which they, we, we use manual turbometer before the curve and after the curve. And um, they also have high speed turbometers that they take it to see if your grease has carried Normally, we like the grease to carry at least five miles from the lubricator down one side, or if it's dual traffic or double uh, direction, uh, two direction traffic, you want to get about 10 miles of track, uh, five miles on each side of the curve greased. And these high speed turbometers will tell you if your grease is working or not working. So nobody can cheat on this and give a product that doesn't work because it's very easy. And frankly, if the grease is not working, the inspector will quickly see metal shavings piling up around the curves. So this is an application that we have been able to show that our bio-based greases perform. By the way, these greases are always applied to the curves. So there are millions of pounds of grease applied to the same areas year after year. And the bio-based products biodegrade and are naturally help, helpful. We also ran some research as part of a US Department of Transportation grant where we greased the the um, straightaways or the tangent tracks. So this is a lubricator, uh, the point of lubrication, and you like to, normally you want your coefficient of friction to be less than 0.3 to get good friction reduction at the flange. And you can see here, we go if each one of these is one mile. So if we wanted to look at areas where we are under 3.3, we've got from here to about here. So it's about seven, eight miles of the track was getting lubrication less than 0.2. And it also shows energy savings on the locomotive of nearly 10% when you grease the entire track. So the greasing of the track, either the straightaways or the curves would not only uh, increase the longevity of the track and the wheels, but it also reduces friction and reduces energy consumption. For locomotives, normally they don't want to see the grease applied to the flange because it could get onto the flat surface of it and cause uh, slippage and breaking issues. So we have a solid stick lubricant that, that is applied, hooked up to the axle of the um, uh, locomotive. And then the, the, the stick lubricant, which is like a two by four uh, in a mixture of plastic, uh, graphite and grease 
is press pressurized by spring against like a crayon rubbing against the flange. And that's very effective for lubricating. Wire rope grease, as I mentioned, it's a very important product because the, the wire ropes on ships or shipyards have to be greased, otherwise the salt water will erode them very quickly. And so we have our greases and actually on Shell LNG uh, ships in the right now in, in the Middle East traveling. And so they are used on um, the, the ropes that are holding the um, long lifeboats or they are used on, on cranes and, and moving. And there are lubricators. We work with OEMs of these um, greasers uh, to, to make sure our product works in the equipment. Drill rod grease is another one. You know, we have right now our greases in some gold mines, uh, mining uh, areas in Mexico. Um, the, the mines are owned by the government and they require the um, contractor to use environment friendly greases. And so the US contractors are using an aluminum complex grease to replace the barium grease. And every time they go three, four, five, ten thousand 10,000 feet into the ground, um, when they pull the, the rods out, they have to regrease it again. So when they take core samples for exploration, or they have to change the bit on the, on the drill, we are using again five, six pails of grease. So this is a very, every time, and, and it's a very large volume, and the environment friendly product is definitely a very good application. A truck grease is another one. We have got a, the first ever bio-based uh, grease that meets the NLGI's highest, most difficult, most stringent specification called GCLB, which if you meet this requirement passing 14 ASTM tests, then your grease can go into the bearing of trucks and vehicles and still meet the um, OEM warranty requirements. So now we have a grease that actually meets the OEM requirement. It's, uh, it, it's rated, there's a standards, so it can be recognized anywhere in the world. And by the way, it's also priced the same as uh, mineral-based greases. Right now in the state of Iowa, the last three years, all of the uh, Department of Transportation, uh, snow trucks and lawn mowing equipment have been using our bio-based GCLB rated grease with great success. So I think this would be another area where the grease can be used in Australia or anywhere in the world to reduce some of that um, because most of that grease will melt and fall on the road or the rainwater washes it or in the truck washes. Uh, food grade is another one. Uh, we have uh, food grade hydraulic oil and greases that are NSF registered because we just think it's natural. Our hydraulic fluid, for example, is 95% edible salad oil quality vegetable oil. And it has some additives that are NSF uh, registered and uh, approved. And so we think that these are very good applications because the aluminum complex version of our food grade grease, for example, is very water resistant. So it, it protects the bearings without, when, when they wash it, the water cannot damage the bearing, get into the bearings. And, and we think that would be a, a, a good application. So we identified five low hanging fruit for vegetable oils. And these are some of the products that were transferred from the university to our ELM in 2000. We had hydraulic oils, greases, metalworking fluid, bar and chain lubricant. We had a transformer cooling oil that we actually sold it to Cargill years ago. So the, 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 <laughs> we are, it's so many years that we are past the, the confidentiality period. And so solid stick lubricant, wood preservative, and six other products um, of different nature. So dust suppressant, for example, or transformer oil, as well as truck grease and, and the ones we've talked about. Now, very quickly, I wanted to mention uh, what or reiterate what Michael said, Mike, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, that environmental lubricants manufacturing does not sell products to the end users. We learned um, a few years ago uh, when we started the ELM that in order for us to reach the level of um, uh, reach to the end users, uh, it's taken a hundred years for petroleum industry to establish their market. For us to come and do that, it will take a hundred years. Or if we could join them and let us let them help us, we can get to that faster. So from the beginning, we decided we like to work with distributors and companies that want to private label our company. Our mission is to convince petroleum companies that are leader in their fields 
and in their groups like Harrison to carry a line of our products next to theirs. Some could use our products under their own label. Some like Harrison decided that, uh, let's say our well curve grease would be ELM brand carried by Harrison. So we have worked for three years. We have sent samples. They've purchased actually pallets of the grease. They've been testing it in their labs. And so now if their customers come to them and want to use these products, their sales and marketing force becomes ELM sales and marketing force. Our goal, however, is to make sure we deliver the highest quality product consistently and then also reduce our costs. So when Harrison as a distributor also adds their margins, we are not out of, the, uh, out of whack with the prices of the market. So with that, we have been able to actually deliver the lowest price, highest quality bio-based oil. And we are just delighted that Harrison as a leading manufacturer of lubricants in Australia chose us to work with us a few years ago. And so with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Mike, see if he wants to add anything and or to Amy to open up to question and answers. And I thank you all for being part of this webinar. Yes, thank you, Lou. That was a very informative presentation. We hope everyone on the line saw value in it as well. Um, we've had a few Q&A questions come through while you were presenting and please, I do encourage anyone who has any more questions to please send them through on the Q&A or put them into the feedback survey after the webinar concludes. For now though, Mike, if I could get you to put your camera on as well, I will ask yourself and Lou a few of the questions. Amy, I know you can hear me, but unfortunately the camera option doesn't, doesn't appear to be popping up at the moment. Oh, just let me see. I think, I think you have the authority. <laughs> we had the same issue um, last night. Um, yes, could, okay. Yeah, there, Sorry about you. that, everyone. Um, welcome, Mike. So um, I'll actually set, give this first question to you, Mike. So I've had a question come through saying we're very interested in bio-based rail curve grease. How do we go about getting this in Australia? So perhaps a little bit of context, and, and Lou, I'm going over some ground you can cover just a moment ago, but rail, rail curve grease is probably your star performer, uh, certainly in uh, in sales and volume, having um, trap one of the uh, the US leading US railroad companies. Uh, the demand for the rail curve grease and the inquiry that we get uh, in this country is potentially quite significant. You've got very extensive railroad um, operations up the eastern seaboard with coal and on the uh, in the west with iron ore. Um, there's a very significant rail requirement. And I think next steps is that all the product testing has been done, the, uh, the field trials have been done, the testimonials are there. Uh, we're really ready to go, Lou, with um, responding to inquiries that come through in this area. Yeah, I was going to add, Mike, that we had actually at the university a $375,000 US Department of Transportation grant to look at six mineral-based, the best known uh, rail curve greases produced by Shell and Mobile and everyone in the US, and six bio-based greases, three of them were of course our own. And we analyzed them not only in the lab, but also in a, environmental rooms to see the cold temperature and, and so on. And also in railroads with lubricators installed and we monitored those for two years and the results were published and they are actually on the website of the US Department of Transportation, which if anyone's interested, they can email us and we'll, we'll give them the link to go. This is a long, like I think about 600 page document with full page uh, pictures and, and everything. So this area, as you mentioned, has been most research in at ELM and at the university. And we believe that we have come up with the best that could be made from vegetable oils. So contact, uh, I guess, uh, should contact um, Harrison and, and Mike, you can have your team guide them to get samples if they wish in pails or in small quantity to touch and feel it. Mm -hmm. But if they have a railroad that they would like to see greases tested, they can, all they need to tell us is what kind of lubricators they are using. Uh, worldwide, either the SKF uh, brand is one, and then there's some European, uh, UK, there's a, a version I cannot remember. And then we have LB Foster from the US which is also very popular both in India and I know in Australia it's used and in Europe, many, many countries they use that. Great, thanks guys. Um, 
Another question we've had come through is, uh, do you supply the solid stick rail wheel lube and what railroad co approvals do you have? Um, uh, <laughs> it's a good question. We, we were supplying this until 2007 where our company actually had a fire in the Greece area. Uh, unfortunately, it was just like what recently happened in the US at ChemTool, which by the way, led to uh, the invention of using microwaves to manufacture grease because of that fire. So unfortunately, since, since 2007, we have not um, marketed any, although we have the technology and recently we have been approached from a European company that wants us to supply them the same products we were doing in 2007. So coincidentally, we have gotten a uh, start on it again, and we should have some of these within the next three months because we have already got an order from this European company. So the solid stick lubricant that we were using, uh, originally they were longer, the 18 inch ones, but the ones that we are supplying Europe are smaller. There are two or three inch units that are um, dovetail into each other. And mostly they are used for uh, trains that are run in the cities. These are um, uh, not, not freight trains and so on. So we, we do not have it right now, but it should be coming back. But we were working with the equipments that were um, actually in, we worked with the inventor of the equipment that applies the, um, the stick lubricant. And um, I do not have currently a railroad that I can name that is using our solid stick lubricant because I said we have not used it for a while. Okay, great. Thanks, Lou. Um, if there is an interest, I'm sorry to interrupt, Amy. If there is an interest, just contact um, Harrison. Yep. And we currently have samples in our uh, at ELM that we can send to them or have samples sent for uh, just touch and feel. But then we need to know what, what uh, kind of um, uh, dispensing equipment they need or they use so we can supply them with the, with the right size um, solid stick lubricant. Great. Thanks, Lou. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. So I've got another one from a, an attendee. Is the shelf life of grease using vegetable oils the same as with current mineral oil? Um, that's a very um, um, that's a very good question because I have a very good answer for it. <laughs> <laughs> They're all good questions, but when, when, the, when the speaker gets excited because He's got some good answers. This is a good question. Actually, all questions are good. So I'm, I'm just making a classroom joke on that. Um, you know, we have looked at greases that have been in pails and enclosed. Uh, our railroad grease, for example, is in a plastic bag, which is also inside a plastic pail. And when there is no oxygen, uh, where the grease is not exposed to oxygen, we have seen greases as high as long as 10 year old that have maintained their properties without any problem. So in general, we say our greases have two years shelf life, but in, if they are not open and they're not open um, exposed to oxygen, um, they could be much longer than two years. And many mineral-based grease companies, when you ask, they give you two years. I don't know what Harrison has for their shelf life, but um, I, I can tell you that as long as they're not open to the atmosphere, because we don't know what happens if it's open, then is it exposed to moisture? Is it hot? Is it cold? So we can't really draw a, a general conclusion. But as long as it is closed and closed and it's not open, minimum two years, uh, you know, uh, it could go as high as five years without any difficulty. We have not seen any shelf, unless you don't know how to make the grease, which if you don't know, then it will shelf harden. So if a grease has hardened and from grade two has gone to grade four or grade five, you know that it wasn't formulated properly or was not developed properly. But a properly uh, reacted grease should not thicken up on the shelf if it's not exposed to oxygen. Um, okay, uh, we're right on time, but I might just fit in one more. Um, and for everyone else who's had questions, we will get back to you um, after the call concludes over the next couple of days with any um, questions you have and give the answers. Please, but, yeah, please email your questions to Amy and then we'll be happy to respond. Yes, um, but I'll, I'll ask this last one, Lou. Um, how do you compare your drill rod grease with barium greases in terms of performance? You know, 
I remember we probably send in excess of 20 different samples, and these are all 12 pails at a time to a mine to test it. And ultimately I had to go there myself. And uh, the way they, they evaluated our product was that they would put it on the rod and they would go into the ground. And of course the water is going through the pipe to center of the, uh, the, the, um, the rod and then wash off and come back up. If the grease would come up and go and get on the holding ponds, then we know the grease is not tachified or it's not sticking to the, um, to the rod properly. Because barium greases actually are wonderful greases because they, they have such a great texture. They wrap around the rod like a, like a fabric, like silk. And so we have, we have worked tremendously, I mean, for many, many different batches until we came up with the right combination of tachyfiers and aluminum complex, which is very water resistant so that we can mimic the same appearance and performance of the, um, uh, of, of the barium grease but the proof is in the pudding. So we had to go there and watch the grease applied to the rod going into the ground. The water is being applied with polymers in it and it washes off. If the, if the grease doesn't come up to sit on the holding pond, then they know the grease worked fine. And so we have basically had to go to the field and convince the, uh, the drillers. Now we have had some of our greases tested in Australia with one distributors a few years back and they said that it didn't work. And, um, and I cannot say that our grease will work in every uh, environment with every water because the hardness of the water, the type of polymer they use, they, they, there are so many different variables. We cannot have one universal grease that will work all over the world. Although someday we hope to, but we have had some areas where they say, regardless of what we tell them, uh, they say, this is not the same as the barium grease. But we have also had a lot of people who are delighted. And right now, the highest selling product for us is our drill rod grease. And 90% of it is going to Canada because Canadians have jumped on this very good. And, and when the price is very close to what the barium greases are, and now the barium grease prices are going up tremendously because of the, everyone knows why after the COVID, uh, we see that as being a, a very good opportunity. We hope to see more of it used in Australia through Harrison. Thank you, Lou. Um, well, that uh, leads us to the end of the webinar. We're a couple of minutes over time. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for taking the time out of your night. Um, we pleasure. appreciate it's not morning or lunchtime over there for you. So um, yeah, we hope everyone enjoyed this webinar. Uh, and just a reminder that we do have the feedback survey that we'd love if you could um, fill out for us once you jump off the call. Uh, Mike, do you have any closing words? Yeah, I've got two things, Amy. And um, um, first of all, just if people would like to inquire further and uh, want to get in contact with us, uh, the email address uh, best used would be hmc.sales at harrison.com.au. Uh, that'll save your inbox getting uh, filled up, Amy. Uh, so that, that uh, email address hmc at dot sales at harrison.com.au. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank Lou very much for uh, making the time to. Um, Bring us up to speed. Um, as always, it's fascinating to, to listen to your insights, uh, Lou, and the take us on the bio journey that you're um, so passionately committed to. Uh, we look forward Thank to continuing you. to work with you and um, and uh, opening up this new market. Thank you very much, Thank Lou. You. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for for all the hard work and Saad for for helping out all of this and and thanks to all of the um, Harrison team. And thank, thank you, you, the audience. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Good, good evening, Lou. Thank you. Thank good you. evening.